as a function of angle. And so we have now everything referenced to a one fixed state of an, uh, just one fixed atom. And so we have all information, amplitude and phase. And of course, this is where we wanted to get to do a tomographic movie, but there are many states involved and we didn't even try. So, but we have all, now all coherent information. I think it's almost full information that you can get on this kind of a process. So I think this is a very beautiful kind of spectroscopy. We've taken it to a triatomic molecule, NO2, and looked at a molecule going through a conical intersection, but then it's more chemistry oriented, and I think it's not appropriate. Do you want me to go on? Or do you want me to stop? Yeah, maybe it's a so would it work? Um, okay, so I want to end with solids. It's come, the issues in solids have come up before. Uh, not really directly in solids, but indirectly in solids. And what happens about the electron? And to a certain extent, I left with something like an issue to solids. If the bromine atom, as they start to come apart, if the electron comes up and hits to another, hits another bromine atom until it drifts too far away, what happens in a solid where I got lots of atoms around? I guess there's no chance you would think of a recollision process in a solid. And if you'd asked me, I would have said so. Uh, that's what I would say. There's been always a, a set of people in solid state physics influenced by these ideas, but I personally never took them seriously. So I never looked at it very much. Um, so, however, when you think about it, we take a great deal of the issues that we deal here, we share with solid state physics, held treated gases and condensed phases in the same thing. So tunneling is still used to describe dielectric breakdown in laser machining with IR pulses. Uh, it really is. Um, so maybe we should go back and reconsider a little bit. So before I do that, then I want to just translate what I, we've been hearing many times here about electrons going out and recollision, recolliding, but put it in solid state language. So this is the atomic case still, but just solid state words superimposed on it. So, tunneling creates an electron and a hole, makes a jump across the band gap, shall I say, across the ionization potential, the band gap, leaving a hole or an ion, which will move by F equals ma, its momentum will be the same as that of the electron, F equals ma, right? So there's no reason the momentum, and it will move in momentum space, but its mass is high, and so its energy is fixed. So it'll be a horizontal line in first order in momentum space. The electron, of course, also moves. It moves in a parabolic band. It moves in a parabolic band, and it comes around, and it goes along, as we've seen, and it finds itself in physical space. But of course, it wasn't at the same, same energy as when it made the transition, or there'd be no harmonics. So it finds itself in physical space in the same place, but in momentum space, it's somewhere else, and it makes a transition from one bend to the other. That's exactly what we've been talking about in solid state language. Okay. Actually, if you go back and you look at the <coughs> atomic literature, you will see that there's really two kinds of harmonics that are created, only one of which we talk about here and everywhere else. But there's a second kind as well. You can think about it. When you make a transition here, you start and you create a current that's now going to flow in the conduction band. And every half cycle, that current has a jump in it because the number of electrons are jumping every half cycle as the electron tunnels. So the current, which is the charge, times the number of electrons as a function of time, times the velocity as a function of time, has a, har high har uh, a higher harmonic, a very high, Component because of the number of electrons or the time dependence of tunnel. So as we build up the population. So this is a single band term, although that is all of the nonlinearity is here, although it caused by transition from a two band. And this is an intrinsically two band term. The dipole is between the two bands in solid state language. So in 2011, Gamir and uh, all 
So that Shabu Gamir, you may know him, he's partly from the community of high harmonics. Uh, he worked with Sang Yu Cheng for a while, I think he did his PhD with Sang Yu Cheng. And he was working with David Reese, and so David Reese and Shambu Gamir in Luna Moro's lab did an experiment looking at 3.5 micron lights interacting with zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is a large band gap, semiconductor, 3.5 EV band gap, and uh, they found high harmonics. They're generated harmonics up to harmonic number 29, I believe, of 3.5 micron light. It was an amazing result. I didn't, as I said, I was very surprised. And so um, we decided, after a long delay, to take a look at it and try to work on it. So I began working, or a student of mine, really, Julio Bamba, began working with Thomas Bravitz, somebody who was in the early days in this field quite a bit, and looked at zinc oxide in a two-band model, a conduction band and a valence band, just like I drew for you before, uh, as closely resembling zinc oxide as possible, uh, 1D, 2D, and eventually 3D model, looking at the processes of emission and separating the harmonic generation in the two ways I described to you before, a one-band model and a two-band model. In a solid state sense, a one-band model is different than in a gas. In a gas, I said, there's the constant jumping of population from one band to the other, leading to a step-like behavior in a current. In a solid, the current is also modulated by the structure of the band as the electron moves not through a parabolic band, but through a band with the shape. Its acceleration is unusual in this sign of negativity, so it has harmonic content. And in fact, if it gets to the edge of the band, it can jump, and that's uh, block oscillations. Um, although it's not clear that, that these experiments got to block oscillation. But that's the, that's the interpretation placed on the block oscillation. So here's the results of the calculations um, for two different cases, no dephasing and dephasing of four femtoseconds, which I think is relatively realistic for the solid, especially given energetic electrons. Shown here in blue are the results of a two-band contribution. You can read in that, or at least at this point, I will encourage you to read it, and I'll try to I'll show you in a minute that it's really true. But this is a recombination-like process coming back again. And here's the results from the one-band contribution. Both, of course, create higher harmonics, but both create them at a different magnitude. You may say that it doesn't look like so much, but you have to notice that that's four orders of magnitude up to the side. So the differences are about four orders of magnitude. Um, so we knew experimentally, of course, that the harmonics are well-defined, and here they're not so well-defined, so the phasing, we put in the phasing to get that realistic aspect. And I think it's... So we looked at a couple of things, since this is done by somebody from our community, it was natural to put gated Fourier transforms and actually place it also in a Levenstein-like model uh, formulation which you can, but here's a gated Fourier transform of the emission function of time and the harmonic number. And doesn't it look a bit like what we've been talking about before? It's got a trajectory like or starts at low frequency and moves to high frequency. Of course, it's not quite the same, but the motion of the electron and structures of bands are not quite the same. And so that's the emission. And here's what we calculate for what was measured by Gamir and uh, et al. Have harmonic field strength here as a function of harmonic cutoff, and we see the scaling with the electric field, just like we've seen in the experiment. <coughs> Under mode of scaling, we see a square of the electric field and the intensity in gas phase harmonics and solid harmonics. Gamir et al. showed that it was electric field, and we see electric field. The region I can describe. Yes. Uh, so, what are the axes of the blue figure? This one is time. I didn't show it here. I cut it out of another one because we have a set of intensities, and because of the block uh, reflections, they're harder to interpret than I didn't want to make this complicated. So, this is time. There's a half cycle from there to there. Um, well, I think uh, you can see that um, that would be there. Yeah, it's from there to there. Yes, half cycle. 
of the driving fuel, which is 3.5 microns in this case. I, I have a number of hand, I don't know what it is, me and few have seconds. And this is energy going up to the cutoff at the fuel strength. All I wanted to show was the uh, trajectory like or the chirp like behavior that you know from gas harmonics. So this is coming out of the model. Um, we wanted to set up an experiment to look at what could be done. So, uh, well again, you've heard in a number of talks about the class of experiments is that can help you label trajectories. Uh, we do a lot of it in Ottawa, and I can't remember who, somebody else gave talk and mentioned using it in an ionization experiment. I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, in any case, so we said, let's take the fundamental and second harmonic. You know how to think about these things as interferometers. If the pulse is making a harmonic, you know that the harmonics come from an interference of the rear. So it's basically an interferometer, too. One going out one way, one going out the other way. And they come in remember, the opposite way. That gives you the odd harmonics that we're used to. And here's we see odd harmonics here. If we put a second harmonic on simultaneously, we change the trajectory a little bit, lengthening one arm and shortening the other, breaking the symmetry, leading to even harmonic generation. We need almost no second harmonic in order to do it. I'm going to show you 10 to the minus 5 is required in this experiment. 10 to the minus 5 of the fundamental. This is incredibly weak. So it's breaking the symmetry. It's like having an interferometer and changing the symmetry. And the radiation goes out one arm or the other arm. You can say that we're biasing the experiment towards a direction or a perspective, but we're really not. Anything you look at will break the symmetry by putting in even harmonics. It was block oscillation or anything. I have a curve to show that, but I do that. So here's the result of such a, model, in such a case. Harmonic numbers shown here, up to the limits in our case in our spectrograph where it got up. Here's the phase delay between the fundamental and second harmonic. Odd harmonics, deeply saturated. Even harmonics, modulated, as you see. On and off, on and off, on and off. And there's the odd harmonics, and they track up to the 18th harmonic. And what's important in order to look at this is to see where you, where the, what phase of the harmonic gives you the maximum asymmetry. And that phase fit around that trajectory leading to that harmonic optimally. So you can see that the phase of the harmonic give the maximum asymmetry is shown here in the purple. It's different than a flat, flat phase across. The experimental data is here. The comparison with the model is shown here as well. And uh, so it's consistent completely with a recollision process. So I, started, I put this earlier, the paper was, now, was published in Nature. If I have a few more minutes, I don't know. I, uh, five minutes. Five minutes. I certainly would be done in five minutes. Okay. The only thing I wanted to say was I said that you can do unusual things in molecules. Tomographic imaging was one. And I think this kind of strange nonlinearity, we can do un other unusual things. And in solids, we can also do something unusual. So I want to end up with that. So is it possible to do something analogous to demography inside a solid? Now there's a number of things you can think of analogous to demography. You might try to do a tomographic image of an exodon. And I think that's a very exciting thing and it might be possible. However, what we decided to look at is could we reconstruct the band differences, the band structure of a, model, of a solid? So let's say, let me make the argument that maybe one can. What we need to do is measure the energy but that's reported in the harmonic number. And we have to know something about the momentum of the electron that makes the transition between one and the other. But we can know the momentum of the electron from the omega-2 omega experiments. They, we have this information sitting there, and we can deconvolve them to tell you about the momentum. So we have momentum and energy measurement and information on the semiconductor in question. So this is an illustration. You make a transition. It goes through it. It finds itself in space. And as long as we know where the K is and we measure the energy, then we can, we can reconstruct the band structure. So that's just stating basically what I say in words. And I have almost no time. 
So, so far our experimental data only goes up to harmonic 16 or 18, and we don't have enough data to fully look at a band structure, which we have to go to 30 dB. What we can only do so far experimentally is identify be between a set of potential bands what was contributing to the harmonics. And we find the low mass band is what's important, but that's what we sort of knew in the first place. So what we did differently was we said, okay, we have the two band model, let's just solve it numerically, let's do the, do the, get the experimental data, let's make this up theoretically, there it is, let's throw away all information on the band, but just take this as experimental data and reconstruct the band from just the information that no information except the, the made up experimental data. So the target band is, there, is, is over here in the middle, and we did not put it in a set of a parameterized bands. We did not allow it to be in, and we searched for the best we could out of some like 500, 600 uh, parameterized bands, and we find the two closest ones, and that's the only ones we got, and that's just published in here. So we believe we can reconstruct from purely optical techniques the band structure of the solid. Now, nobody cares about zinc oxide. Nobody cares about silicon. They know it. Uh, so it's not interesting. But it may be interesting in high pressure materials where you can't get photoelectrons out. It may be interesting in rapidly changing materials where the band structure is changing because of other, other processes that you're doing to the material. So, but we think that there's now an all optical method to look at the band structure of semiconductors, uh, at least large semiconductors. So let me just uh, finish off then. Um, oh, so we find very similar results in silicon and other semiconductors. I forgot to say that the perturbing field that we need in order to give, to make this noticeable to omega is 10 to the minus five. This is almost no field at all that could be applied with the DC field. In fact, we can now measure fields inside semiconductors. We can measure terahertz this way. You need almost no field in order to modify the harmonics by harmonic signal. Solids provide a medium for add a second uh, devices, I think. Harmonics are sensitive to very small fields, even fields found in ordinary electronics. And so we should be able to watch ordinary electronics switch, should it be interesting. Uh, even in comprehensive, comprehensive images of a surface using, uh, tum uh, using uh, these uh, diffractive techniques that we heard from Margaret yesterday. High harmonics are very tolerant to electronic dephasing. And it's possible to apply tomography to solids to get band structure and maybe to look at wave, pack wave functions of orbital impurities. And I think liquid phase, maybe, and large molecule is also in play for this as a possible diagnostic. Of course, it's trivial to put almost anything in front of the laser beam and see if you get harmonics, and we get harmonics from almost everything. And that's too, too simple, but we get it from graphene harmonics. It's amazing. I would never have thought we would. We get it from mono layers of graphene, and we get it from stretched uh, rubber gloves, right? So we get harmonics from such things. Um, let me just end my part. I think that this is a dramatic and really exciting area. Uh, we extend 50 years tradition of ultra-fast science by pushing the, the duration of pulses down by two orders of magnitude. That's what we've done in this Adisec community. We've extended 50-year tradition of nonlinear optics. We open a whole new direction in gases and now beyond. This is strong field nonlinear optics, so it can be quantitative and it can really, really work can allow us to do new kinds of diagnostics that were never possible before. I think we build a 100-year tradition of x-ray science. We integrate x-rays and lasers. You've heard about this everywhere here, how the integration is occurring. And it's got to be important, it seems to me. Thereby, we extend this, the spectral reach of laser spectroscopy up into the region where it's been simply before only available in big machines. And we influence, but we don't have nearly such influence, um, on the tradition of collision science offering in those areas where collisions can be driven by lasers, but they could be large range of areas. We open the possibility of time resolution. So I think it's, uh, we, we have the potential for very huge impact in science generally. Okay, thank you very much. It's been great.
and there's the group that does all the work. Thank you so much, Paul. But I'm in Tucson, or down in Tucson. <laughs> Enjoying the summer. Work. Enjoying the warmth. <laughs> so we are kind of running a bit late, but, yeah, but if there are some urgent questions, we should still take them. Huh? But you have an urgent question. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> not super urgent. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, was uh, would the sink of sight uh, the large band gap critical, or can you do smaller band gap sink of sight? Uh, well, we looked at. Uh, what so far, um, we don't know. So, uh, so I, maybe I should. I could talk a long time, and so I was trying to think of this. We've used always 3.5 micron light, so I don't know how far down we can go. But we can do silicon, and silicon has got a much smaller band gap. But for this, it's the direct band gap that counts, so it's about 2 EP in silicon. So we make it, you make a jump across the direct band gap. Um, so we can do silicon. Um, we have looked at gallium arsenide, but there's not so much interest in there. Um, it's not clear. I, I would say that the issue of harmonics, to give you a, maybe I should say it to everybody, the issue of harmonics from solids will be more complicated than it is from gas. From solids, this is, I think, clearly recollision, large band gap semiconductors. There's work done in uh, SiO2, a very you know, dielectric. And I think there's no chance that's recollision. This is a different process, probably um, different than almost anything we've thought about very much. It looks like the electron is highly localized and the processes are quite different. Maybe it's almost two level harmonics. We've been doing work on this some in, in Ottawa trying to understand the breakdown in large band gap dielectrics, and there's a lot of work on that. And there's work in terahertz on this, and it seems also to be very different. We would say the phasing would kill recollision with terahertz, and that's not inconsistent with what's seen in terahertz experiments. So solids will be more nuanced in a broader range of strong field processes, but high harmonics seem characteristic of a number of strong field interaction. So there are these three mechanisms probably play that way, and maybe more. But there is a window that may be a reasonably interesting I think mostly it's important for diagnostics. That's why I like to start with the band gap. I like to look for diagnostics. I don't understand. This, this is great. You're still here this afternoon, right? Well, I'm staying until Monday. I leave oh, Monday morning. Oh, yeah. So, so you guys, you should absolutely make sure that he doesn't get to relax. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's been great.